Believe it or not, Take Tuesday is back. And you're probably wondering, hey, TJ, what took you so long to upload this? To which I would reply, you actually have no idea how difficult it was to get the files for this video. They're in the computer! Now that we finally have the files though, we can actually get started and work on understanding what I promised nearly two years ago. Not embarrassed by that, which is how do I get this crazy go snippet working? So I'm gonna walk you through top to bottom on how I wrote this, some of the different techniques that we used, and then hopefully this should give you a flavor, not just for some ideas about what you can do with Lua snips, but also more broadly with Tree Sitter and Lua. At the end, I'll give you a brief overview of some plans and some future ideas I have for this series, so make sure you stick around till then. Smash the like button, let's get to it. But before I show you how we make this snippet, I just wanna remind you of what it actually does. And the short answer is it's going to use tree sitter to determine what the return type of whatever function we are currently inside of is and use that to generate defaults so that when you do the old classic go meme of we're gonna call a function, we have some value. So my val in this case is the one that I did. We can say get some value. And then we could say hello. And then we could say, actually, I want to errors wrap this or no, I don't want to errors wrap this. And then I can keep on moving, right? So instead of having to remember to do this if error not equals nil all the time and to provide defaults for each of these that are reasonable, we just don't have to do that. And we just do this one expansion, right? And this even can go so far as knowing that if something returns here, like an int and an error, and we're inside of this function, then if we expand this here, we're able to see that, look, this knows that I'm currently inside of a function closure, right? And so I know that I should return zero and error for this. So it's able to do quite a few things like this. I want to show you how we did it. And hopefully you learn from this a lot of really powerful tools, not just for snippets, but more broadly for any of them too. So let's do it. This is my Go snippets file. The first thing I want you to know is this little thing I have at the top, which tells Lua Snip, hey, just clear the snippets for Go every time we source this file. So whenever I run source percent like this, it'll clear all of the snippets and then any snippets I add below will be re-added for Go. This is really convenient as you're iterating or sort of exploring new ideas. You don't have to completely restart NeoVim every time you wanna try a new snippet. First things first, we need to pull everything from Lua Snip into scope so that we can use these different nodes and shortcuts to quickly and easily create the snippets that we're going to do. Primary ones I want to highlight are this FUMPT A, which is for formatting with angle brackets. Definitely we'll be covering that soon. And then this repeated node, which is now from extras, so you don't have to use the one that we made in the previous video. Other than that, we've got our snippet, choice, dynamic, insert, text, and a snippet node. We're going to show you how to use each of those as we're going forward. Now that we have the important context, we can move down actually to the bottom of this file. If you're following along and you've gotten the link from the description, this is actually at the bottom. I want to show you sort of our end result and work our way back to the building blocks. I think that that makes a lot more sense in this case because you need to see why we're tackling each of the problems that we're tackling. So what do we have here? We use our add snippets function from Lua Snip, and we're going to add it to go only, which allows you to pass a list of new snippets. In this case, we're just going to add one. We make a new snippet, which is EFI, which is obviously for extra freaking incredible. Uh, obviously, I, I actually had it for errors for insert mode, but that's fine. You can remember it however you want. You should come up with your own mnemonics. And now we're going to use that FUMPT A function that I talked about. FUMPT A, there's a sort of corresponding one that's just FUMPT, but FUMPT A I like because it uses these angle brackets to uh, basically declare where what names should be replaced inside of a format string. This keeps you from having to like positionally remember which one is in which place and also really increases the readability, I think, of the snippets that you're doing. So what you'll see here is when we have these two angle brackets here for something like val, what that actually means is it's gonna look that up in this table to determine which thing should be, which node should be placed in this location. So in this case, we have an insert node, which is just where we type something, right? And this is the first one that we jump to. So we're going to jump to here first. And when we type, we're going to be sort of saving that value into the first node. So that part's powerful. Then we have our air, which you also saw where I was changing. And I'll jump over to here where you see we have this air same. This repeats number two. So for air, 
we have this in jump node or jump position two. Air same says, hey, repeat whatever is in node two. So that's how when we when I was typing what the error was, you could see that updating in air same. And then we have F for a function name, some args. And then here's where the real magic is going to happen, right? This sort of result. This is a dynamic node. We're going to go over that. Don't worry. And then here's our finish, right? So at the end, we're just going to jump out to the end of this. This is how we got that nice sort of experience of jump, 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 jump. Okay. And now I'm just going to keep writing instead of writing sort of the standard boilerplate that everyone likes to sort of poke fun at, at go. But of course, at least it's not try catch from TypeScript. Am I right? <laughs> Let me know in the comments if I'm right. Yeah. So then what does this dynamic node do? Well, the first thing we'll notice is it's in jump position five, right? Cause we go one, two, three, four, five. We actually don't ever jump to this error same node. That one just is mirrored from what's ever in this air position. The other thing to note about the dynamic node is that it passes this two and three. What this says is this function here needs to be passed information about whatever nodes are in two and three. Okay. I just did one and two, but you know what I mean? Two and three. I can count. I, pr I promise it's not an off by one error. It's just recording. Okay. Let's go look at what go return values actually looks like as a function. So go return values, which is the function that we pass to the dynamic node takes a single argument called args. And this is going to be the references to the nodes that we passed originally. Now might sound confusing, but remember we passed two and three, which just means, Hey, whatever's going on in node two and node three pass those whenever we evaluate this function. All right. And so what do we return? We return a new snippet node, a dynamic node. Generally speaking is going to return a new snippet node so that Lewis snip can evaluate it later. Okay. And so what do we do here? We say, I actually don't care about which position it's in. Just put it in the position of where I am. Right. So it's sort of like uh, nil in this case says, figure that out for me, please. And then we're going to pass this function that I wrote called go result type. This is going to return the different nodes that we need to create. Go result type is going to take some information about the current function, right? That's those nodes. And then it's going to return to me a bunch of new snippet nodes to insert. And so this is where we actually start getting into some interesting parts of what's going on with tree sitter. So the first thing that we need to do as we're evaluating this is we need to say, Hey, what is the closest function or method for that matter? Cause they're sort of different syntactically and go, even though they're the same thing for what we want to do in terms of returning. So what function are we currently enclosed by? And that's generally speaking, I mean, we're looking for some node in tree sitter and I'll show you this in a second. That is either a function declaration, a method a declaration or a funk literal. So we're sort of like looking for nodes that look like this thing. We're going to search from where we currently are and keep checking our parent until we find a node that is one of these types. Let's take a quick look at the tree. And I think that will clear some stuff up for you. So if we go back to the example that I started with, what you'll see here is when my cursor is in this spot, this will get highlighted over here in inspect tree, which is now built into NeoVim, if you didn't know. But inspect tree will tell you, here's the current tree sitter tree that we're sort of experimenting with. And if what you notice is the parent of this body is actually this function declaration, right? When I put my cursor on that location, you'll notice that this whole area is highlighted. So this says, hey, everything inside of here is this function declaration. This is really important because this is how we're using to find out if we're in a function like this, or if we have some function like this and we're inside of here. Now you'll notice I have a func literal right here, right? This func literal is sort of where we're going to catch that node as we're walking up the tree because we want a different return type when we're inside of here versus when we're right here. Those should return two different types of things. That's really important. That's the first part of where we're starting to bring tree sitter in to NeoVim is we can say, we don't need to figure out where we are with regex or something. We can actually use the structure of the program itself to determine what the return type should be in this case. And so that's the first thing that we're going to do. And this will get us eventually to this function declaration note. That's part one, very important. So now that we've been able to find out which node we're currently inside of, one thing you may not have known <laughs> about tree sitter is you can actually define your own custom queries and load those. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, Hey, I want to get my own return snippet query for go. And I want to use that to be able to see what captures I have for this note. To understand what that means, let's go ahead and take a quick peek at this snippet. 
So this is actually all we have inside of our query. It's a relatively simple query. And you'll notice I just put this inside of my config under queries slash go slash return snippet dot HCM. You could name this whatever you wanted as long as you put it in queries and go and then used the sort of head of that file name to find it. And what this does after you are willing to look past that it's Lisp, I know some of you are allergic to that and that's okay. I'm not judging, even though it's, a, I think it's quite elegant, but what this does is this basically says, I'm looking for something like a method declaration and then whatever is in its result, return a match under the type. Then I want to do the same for function declaration, right? And notice that I'm returning the same match type for each of these, or you'll often hear capture group. That's really the better term for it. But if you're not familiar with trees consider you may not mean anything to you. And then the last one is func literal. And we have this result as well in a type. So each of these is three different types of nodes that you'll encounter in the tree sitter tree, but we need to capture any of them. Uh, to sort of work with the rest of the function. And so to do that, we actually use this these two square brackets here. And what this tells TreeSitter is say, any of these, you should consider a match. Any one of the three, that works great. And so that's what this does. And so each of these are individual matches and it just says, find me any of these guys here. So here's our transform. What this is gonna do is it's gonna take the text that we've been given, something like int or mystruct or bool or error, right? And we're going to take that and determine what should we put in place of that value. So the first thing that we have to do is I sort of build up a, a few ways that we can check if something matches different things, because we want to do different types of things, depending on what the type is. Now you might be saying, TJ, that's really confusing. What are you talking about? I'm just saying, if we have my struct and error, we're going to want to return something very different for my struct versus error. And indeed, you're going to want to do something different when you have something like this, which is a pointer, because the idea would be for this, you want to return nil here instead of some value, right? Because the default value for a my struct is nil as opposed to a default value for an actual struct itself is just the empty struct. Okay. So basically what we have to say here is what we want to do is we're going to say for each of the conditions that we have, I want to see if it matches. And then if it does, we're going to either put in a text node or something a bit more complicated. And if we didn't find anything that matches, then just put in the value and I'll fix it up manually, right? So that's sort of like our fallback case here. So what do these conditions look like? That's where things get a bit interesting. These are sort of our default values and their conditions. So if we have something like int, you'll notice once again, right? When we have, um, when we have int here, it just puts in a zero value here because that's the default for int. That's what I, I like. You could change this to be something else, whatever you wanted. For bool, it's false. And for string, it's an empty string. Things get a bit more complicated when we have some of the different types available to us. So for example, if we see that we have an error, then what we can do is I use a library when I used to write Go a lot, at least I use this library sometimes called errors where you need to wrap the error based on the context of what you're doing. So this is why we can do something like this. If we delete the snippet that we had and we expand this again, and we say, you know, my val and get some value and then we say X, Y, Z, right? I can actually switch between this like wrapped version of this, which tells me, oh, this was from calling get some value and we're inside of here, right? This is a way to wrap the value. And this is another sort of thing that I was feeling a little frustrated with what writing over and over and over inside of Go. So what I did to do that is I create a choice node same building blocks we learned in the earlier videos, right guys? Like it's the same building blocks. And I just said, Hey, either just put the error name. That's the node that we passed that we tracked all the way back from when we passed two and three right here, this guy right here. And this was saying, Hey, this is the error name that we have here. When we pass this in, we just, I just named it error name by passing this so that I could remember and not have to always pass around args one, one, right? So this is just literally creating a table to remind myself to make it easy, right? But if we go back to here, this is saying, hey, either pass the error name or pass the error name and the function name and sort of wrap those two things. So this is really, really convenient for those types of things that you often can sort of forget to do or you don't remember to do them. The snippet can just figure it out for you, which I think is really cool. Now we get a little bit more complicated than even error. In this case, we say, hey, if a type has a star in it, that means it's a pointer. So in that case, we need to return nil. So the condition for this case is, hey, can we find a star in this string? If so, 
then the value that we want to return is nil, right? Because that's the default value for something that's a pointer. And then the last case I have, which is just sort of like a nice one for me, is that usually if there's no star and like a capital, this happened to be the case for my Go code, then you would say, so that's not string find the star. And if the upper, if the first character is uppercase, basically, right? Then what we're going to do is we're going to return a choice that basically says, hey, it could either be uh, my struct itself with this, or sometimes it, it, it just the text itself. And I'll show you what that does. If we go back to this case, where notice now this is for a my struct, right? So my struct and, you know, something, it doesn't really matter in this case. We can actually switch between these two values just in case. Uh, this was sort of personal preference for how you'd want to do this, right? Because then you could type uh, val errored or something. You could do whatever you wanted, right? The snippet is not the end of the line. It's just to help get rid of a bunch of the extra typing that you're trying to do. So once you know that, that's actually everything that happens in the function. Let's go from the from the bottom again to where we are here, just to show you really quickly how each of these pieces fit together now that you've been introduced to each of them. So we start again at our snippet. This snippet declares what the format looks like and declares the names of each of the things that we wanna use inside of here. And then we have this special type of node called the dynamic node that calls a function. This function eventually returns a new snippet, which is just the result of figuring out which nodes we want to put inside. We do just a little bit of tree center magic, really not that much crazy stuff, right? Where we sort of get the current scope that we're in. And then we look for inside of that node, right? We use our query to look inside for that node and find which things match our capture groups. If we have a capture group for that thing, then we're gonna return the result. Right. And so when we go to here, we say, oh, there's either a parameter list or a type identifier. The important bit of here is we're eventually calling transform on the text inside of there. And then this is just saying, hey, do we have any conditions that match? Is it an int or a bool or a string, an error, a pointer or sort of a struct? And then once we have that, we just use Lua, which we already know how to write and we already know how to manipulate strings to determine what a good default value is. And that's it. A lot of the first time you're going to encounter this, I think it's going to feel way, which is really complicated, really complex, but hopefully I've shown that you can break this down into much smaller pieces and understand each one. And each of these pieces is actually something you can use more broadly within NeoVim as well, which I think is great. You're sort of leveraging these pieces uh, and their interplay together, which allows for a lot of really fun possibilities for snippets. And that's it. That's another Take Tuesday in the books. I know it's been a long time. My current plan that I'm shooting for is I'd like to record another video of Kickstart that's updated that uses Lazy, it talks a little bit about extending and some stuff like that. And then for each of the following Take Tuesday style videos, we will build them just directly off the Kickstart configuration. This will let you really easily sort of, if you're already a Kickstart user or already sort of understand what's going on with Kickstart, you can easily use that knowledge to place the exact config that I use inside of there. And you won't have sort of any hyper specific teach kind of things there. I'm streaming full time now and working on content. So hopefully we'll be able to start cranking these out regularly, probably not once a week because I want to make sure that I really understand the plugin well before we make a video, but we'll hopefully more often than once every two years. Thanks for your patience, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, great ways to support me are subscribe on Twitch or support me on GitHub sponsors and smashing the like button and subscribing to the channel. Those are both free, so that's pretty nice. Thanks, everybody, and I will see you around. Enjoy your NeoVimming. See you, everybody. Ember, come. 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 Snippets! They're in the computer!